A second major problem was they really ignored the importance of credit markets. I'll come back to that very briefly a little bit later, but they tried to summarize the entire financial market in terms of demand and supply for money. A single equation based on transaction demand for money. But credit is more complicated than that. And because they didn't model credit, they didn't model the banking system, they didn't understand what happened when credit disappeared and the banking system was on the verge of collapse. To me, it's, astound, uh, it's amazing that so many central banks, including the Federal Reserve Board, used models which ignored banks. <laughs> because if one thing you would think the central banks would, under, would, would be concerned about, it's banks. But among the economists, they acted as if banks were just an institutional detail that could be ignored. And you could just look at the demand and supply for money. And following that, they didn't really understand very clearly the channels through which monetary policy exerted its influence. They focused almost exclusively on the interest rate. And even today, you see that focus, that obsession with the interest rate, when many economists, almost the majority of mainstream economists in the United States, suggest that the main problem that reason that monetary policy today is not effective is called the zero lower bound. The argument is that if we could, you know, we've lowered interest rate to zero, if we could only get interest rates lower, we would succeed in stimulating the economy. And what they do is make a, a, a reference to the Keynesian liquidity trap. But the situation in the Great Depression and the situation today are totally different. In the Great Depression, we had deflation. Prices were falling at the rate of about 10% a year. So when you couldn't lower interest rates below zero, the real interest rate adjusted for inflation was 10%. That was a high real interest rate. And that meant that discouraged investment, almost surely. But right now in the United States, the rate of inflation is around 1% to 2%. So the real interest rate is negative. The real interest rate is about minus 1%, minus 2%. Does anybody really believe that if we lower real interest rates to minus 3 or minus 4%, suddenly investment would start in the United States? No. So it's not the zero lower bound that's the real problem. It's something else. It has to do with the credit channels and the credit mechanism that's been broken. And because they haven't understood this, because they focused on the role of the interest rate, they haven't really fixed a financial system and they haven't understood the underlying sources of America's continuing malaise. A third mistake was a single-minded, I've already referred to, was a single-minded focus on the interest rate. As if that were the only instrument at the disposal of the central bank. And the central bank shouldn't use regulatory mechanisms. The reason for this peculiar view was the belief that one shouldn't interfere with the market. But central banks are, by definition, interfering with the market. They're setting one of the most important prices, the interest rate. So how could you believe in a coherent way that you should not interfere with the market when you are, by definition, interfering with the market? Now, there's another proposition that they could have argued that it's optimal to interfere only with one instrument or in one aspect. But there's no theory behind that. In fact, those of you who studied optimal tax theory know that the great contribution of Ramsey was to show that in tax policy, it's better to have blocks of small taxes than one big distortion. 
So again, there was no theoretical basis to that conclusion. What we know now is that central banks should use all the instruments at their disposal. Let me go back to the crisis. In 1994, the U.S. Congress gave the Federal Reserve a wide range of additional tools. They said that they had the responsibility to manage the mortgage market. They had the responsibility to make sure that the level of down payments was sufficiently high to stabilize the market, that the people loan uh, income to, to uh, service requirements were uh, appropriate. In other words, they said, you can't just rely on interest rates. You have to look at a number of other regulatory uh, mechanisms. One of the members of the Reserve, of the Federal Reserve Board, pointed out that there was a bubble growing, and that had to be contained. And if we didn't contain it, the bubble would break, and the economy would be would be in a disastrous position. But Greenspan, and then later Bernanke, basically said bubbles don't exist, and if they exist, we can't tell them. And if they can't, even if we could tell them, there's nothing we can do about it. But there was something they could do about it. They had the quantitative, they had the regulatory uh, authority to do something about it. And eventually, after the crisis, they did something about it. But that was, to use an American expression, it was closing the barn door after the horses are out. Well, uh, the general proposition here is that one sh there are many instruments and that one should use all of them, particularly once one recognizes that one of the major mechanisms for macroeconomic control is credit availability. That it's not just the interest rate, it's the spread between, it's not the T-bill rate, it's the spread between the T-bill rate and the lending rate, which is an endogenous variable, and it's the availability of credit. And those, ver those things, credit availability and the spread, are affected not just by the open market operations, but all the whole set of regulatory structure uh, that the central bank can impose. 